when things are going wrong, right, everything goes wrong. So first, there was no mic, and I just realized that the first slide, I didn't center it properly. Stupid. The sermon is a bit to one side. <laughs> so, um, I, hope that's not, I hope that's not how it's going to turn out today. So, um, so before we start, I would like to just have a prayer. Um, Father Lord, I just want to thank you for, for this moment, this opportunity to share um, the thoughts you put on my heart, Lord. I pray that you should please open everyone's heart to listen. I pray that you should guide me and let the words come out as you want them to, Lord. I'm grateful to you for this opportunity. Um, thank you so much for everything. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah, so before I start, I, I think it's usually a good idea to just get all potential for legal troubles out of the way. So, um, Shaw, can you move to the next slide, please? Okay. Actually, okay, maybe it's the screen. It's probably not my fault, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think... Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. It wasn't my mistake. So, um, two years ago, um, in the middle of the pandemic, I started listening to a lot of sermons online, and I came across a sermon that I thought was very relevant at the time, and it impacted me a lot. But after I listened to it, I thought, it was relevant not just for that period, but also just for life in general. And I told myself that the first time I'll have an opportunity to, to share, I was, I was going to share those thoughts. So I've waited for this for about two years, right? So I'm hoping it works out well. But the reason why I'm making the disclaimer um, first, because I would like to give credit to the person who gave the sermon. It's a pastor called Sarah Jakes. And I think it's important to give credit and then the second reason for the disclaimer is that um, in case you, you're watching videos on YouTube and you come across a sermon with the same title, I think it's important you don't leave a message accusing them of stealing this idea from me. <laughs> That's the idea. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, next slide, please. So everything must go. So that's the title of the sermon for today. Now. From time to time, we see this sign on the high street. It's one that really triggers a lot of emotions. It's one that pushes people to spend a lot of money. And you normally have arguments that maybe some stores affect the prices and make more profits and the margins are not as big, but that's not relevant now. What I wanted to talk about was the reason, the motivation behind this. Now, usually when stores have this sign, it's because the season is changing and the old stock would not be as profitable as it used to be because nobody would want winter clothes in summer and vice versa. So they normally want to, and they wouldn't want to keep it to the next season because it might be out of fashion. So they would normally want to get rid of the old stock, which is not profitable, in order to make room for more profitable items. And the question I have for, the, for us this morning is, what if as Christians we could live our lives with this type of attitude, what would our lives turn out to be like? In other words, what if we could constantly check in in our lives and take stock of items, take stock of behavior patterns or, or things that we are doing that are not profitable, that are maybe holding us back in our growth and replace it with more profitable items? What would our lives be like? Now, this idea is not really, it's not a spectacularly new idea. It's something that's embedded in a lot of things we hear. So I think about three weeks ago, I went for one of these full body health checks. You know the one NHS sends you an email that you should suggest that you should go for those health checks when you reach about um, three, three quarters of, of Stefan's age. That's, <laughs> that's when they send you those emails, right? <laughs> And I went for the check, and, and the, the first person I met was giving me ideas on how to improve your mental well-being and said it's a good idea to write things down and find out things that you think you could change that are making you stressed out and replace it with more profitable things. And, and then I told him I wouldn't be able to give up my job, right? Because that's the number one source <laughs> of stress. But then um, on the other hand, another person I met talked about 
replacing um, in my diet, looking for the bad fats or bad sources of cholesterol and replacing it with the good ones. And so the whole idea of letting things go that are not profitable, it's not a new idea. But what I found out is that it's actually more challenging when you have to initiate it yourself. And the reason for that is that for, you, for it to be effective, you need to be very, very critical. You need to be able to be ruthlessly critical of yourself and, and be brutally honest. And that can be hard. But luckily, I think in the Bible as Christians, we, life presents us with a lot of opportunities for us to have these types of um, this type of moment where we can assess ourselves. And, and, and I'm going to look at a few examples of that today. If you can please go to the next slide. And it is out of place. I don't know how I can fix that. You know what? You just make out what you can see. Okay, I'll, I'll read from my phone. So um, the first verse I'm going to read from is um, Psalm 139, verse 23 to 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See there is no offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. So this is a psalm of David. And if I'm honest, right, I'm not really... Prayers like this actually scare me. And the reason for that is that it's almost like putting yourself out there, asking God to set you and look in your innermost being and find out things that maybe you are aware of but you are afraid to admit. And the best analogy I can think of was something like this is, imagine being at the airport and you've walked past customs with nothing to declare. And then you walk past without problems, then you go back to the customs officer and say, listen, I have nothing to declare but I just want you to check my stuff just in case I might have missed something out, right? That's scary. And, and a more practical example that comes to mind was when I first got, um, when I got married, we, Oge and I, and I think a few other couples here, went for this seminar for eight weeks called Dynamic Marriage Workshop. And there, was quite a lot of, there were a lot of important things I learned there, but one that really stood out was an activity that was suggested at times when you at times when you're going through a difficult time with your spouse and you're stuck and you can't really move and the way the activity was presented was something like each person comes and reassures the other person that they have a safe environment to be open about their thoughts and what this means is that the other person reassures you that you can be completely honest about what you're feeling about them, about yourself, why you're upset, and basically you strip, out, strip down all your defenses, just put your heart out. It's almost like showing the, the other person all your cards and trusting that they wouldn't use it against you and take it for granted. And it's quite a difficult activity. It's difficult because you're putting your defenses down and you're trusting that the other person wouldn't take advantage of that. Mm -hmm. And for both parties, it's hard because you might, they might reveal things about you that are scary, things that you, you're particularly not proud of, and you get it raw in, a, in an honest fashion. So it's one of the reasons why for me, if I think of this prayer, it's difficult with your spouse searching you, but for God to search you and find all the parts of your life, it seems a lot more scary. And, and even more scary is that if God were to answer this prayer, right, he's not going to send you an email with a list of items you need to change. Okay? <laughs> it's most likely going to be he would put you in situations where those weaknesses would be revealed, and that can be scary. So um, when, I, when I started, when I became a Christian, I think about 23 years ago now, and... I told my dad that I'm now a Christian, and I explained what it meant to him. And my dad told me he was really worried for me for that decision. And he, he explained that the reason why he was worried was that in his life, he's experienced that people who have higher faith would normally face more difficult challenges. And that since I was starting out life, I had just finished university, I was going to 
start my career, he felt that the decision to become a Christian was deliberately taking steps or taking steps myself that would make it hard for me to, to settle into life. Now, I had some opinions on that, right? But I'll, I'll talk about it later. So I think there's a good time where I'm just going to call on Nathan to please come up to read the main verse for today. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. <coughs> Immediately, a rooster crowed. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. So... Now, this is a story we're very familiar with, right? And sometimes when we're very familiar and we know what the end is, it, that can stand in the way of getting the most out of it. So I just want us to take a moment to think about what this, was, this must have been like for Peter in this situation where he, what, he didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't know if Christ was going to die and never be risen, right? So it was a really, really difficult emotional um, position to be in. And to, to understand what even made this difficult, you, you need to go back to the beginning of earlier that night. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31 to 34, I'm going to read. Then Jesus told him, this very night you will all fall away on account of me. For it is written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter replied, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now, the reason why this was difficult for Peter in particular was that if you followed um, just the, the disciples and the relationship they had with Jesus, throughout Jesus' ministry. Peter always took the leadership position at the key moments. So in Matthew, we're told that the first of the two disciples that Jesus called was Peter, and Peter dropped everything in order to follow Jesus. And dropping everything meant he, he basically gave up his career to follow Jesus. Now, looking at the denial of Jesus, you, you think that the Peter who denied Jesus is different from the person who dropped everything to follow him. Peter actually walked on water. His faith was so much that he stepped out of a boat and he did walk on water before his faith failed him, right? But you'd, you'd realize that the, the man who walked on water is not the same man as the one who denied Jesus at this moment. And I think most important of all is that when Jesus asked all the disciples who he was and no one knew the correct answer, Peter was the one who gave the correct answer and Jesus made a promise. He said, you're the rock on which I will build the church. And Peter was the rock, but this night when he denied Jesus, it was revealed that this rock had cracks. And this was the problem. This was the reason why that night was so important. And I think this is one of the reasons, right, why God is not going to send you an email with a list of things you need to improve. Because if you think about it, Jesus had told Peter, this is what you will do. You will deny me. But in that circumstance, Peter was like, there's no way that's going to happen. And if he hadn't found himself in a situation that would actually reveal the weakness, then we would never, he would never actually believe that he had that weakness. And I think... As Christians, right, we're going to be faced with tough situations in life. We're going to find ourselves in situations where our weaknesses, our insecurities are revealed. We're going to be 
life is going to deal off tough check, um, circumstances. Life is going to be presented with opportunities to break us, and it will break us over and over again. And this can be hard. This can be hard because you will think having a relationship with God should at least give you a, give you a degree of freedom from all of that. And that's why you will hear people say, if God existed, why does this happen? And now, the truth is that life deals everyone tough circumstances. It doesn't discriminate, Christian or non-Christian. In fact, the, the, this is captured very nicely in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. So Ecclesiastes chapter, chapter 9, I'll read verses 1 and 2. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands, but no one knows whether love or hate awaits them. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good, so with the sinful. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. So there's no discrimination in tough, tough circumstances in life. And being Christians does not exempt us. But I do feel like the challenge might feel more difficult when we are Christians. And I'm going to explain, and this is quite an important thing, right? Because it is, it is something that I struggle with a lot of times when you think about being in difficult situations or life being tough. And I'm going to try and explain how I understand it or how I try to get around this with three examples I've given earlier. So I'll go back to when my dad told me that he, he felt that being a Christian meant I was going to have a more difficult path. And he did explain it a bit more. And what he said was that when you're a Christian and you choose, make the decision to, to live your life as a Christian properly, it means you've chosen to adopt some moral standards. And if, you, if you're a real Christian and you choose not to compromise in those standards, when life brings all its tests, right, as it normally would, because you have a higher bar that you have set, it's going to be more difficult for you to scale through those circumstances. And that is what actually played out a few months later. So I had just graduated from school, like I said. So I had a job, my first job. It was, it was um, with a small family-owned business where, understandably, the, my boss wanted to grow his business. So he wanted to know what each person was doing. So. Um, I got an interview for a different job, which was like my dream engineering job to start my career. And, and when it was time to go for that interview, because he managed everything so closely, I knew that if I told him, if I took vacation, he would want to know why, right? And I knew that because I had become a Christian, I didn't want to lie to him. So I called my dad and I'm like, okay, what can I do? And my dad was like, okay, not to say I told you so, right? But, <laughs> but it would actually be easy for me to call your boss and just tell him, I need you in our city. And he will understand because they were about the same age. He said, but I'm not going to do that because I know that will be compromising your standards. And he didn't. And then I did go for the interview and I got fired from my previous job. And so I was out of work for about three months. And it would play out that life was actually difficult because of that decision. But it's very important to make the distinction. It's not that God makes life more difficult because you're a Christian. It's just because the bar is higher. And I, if I try again to use a second example of the, the married workshop I went for, in the context of a marriage, having faith would be similar to making, um, trusting the other person, trusting your spouse that if you were to strip down your defenses, if you were to come to them naked without, with all your insecurities, having faith would be, mean trusting that they wouldn't take you for granted and they wouldn't use it against you and they would 
they would understand in that circumstance. And now when you do that, it's a difficult thing because the conversations you're going to have if each party is playing fairly would be extremely difficult conversations because this would be the concept conversations at the core of your personality. Mm -hmm. So in my own case, I had I was 34 years when I got mm -hmm. married, right? So it meant that those discussions would be discussions that challenged behavior traits I had built over 34 years. It meant that it was going to be a conversation where you'd have to you'd have the humility to to say, okay, this is not I've always been like this, but I could change. Sometimes it can be a case of, well, this is who I am. Deal with it, right? But having faith in that context means you trust the other person and each person plays fairly and you will have more difficult conversations. But the more the difficult conversations you have, the less you will need to have those difficult conversations. So in the short term, it means you're going to have a more difficult path if you have faith in that context. Now, the alternative to that, which would be akin to not having faith, would be, okay, I, I want to be honest, but I know he can't take it, or I know she can't take it, and that is just going to cause more strife. So it's better to just let it slide, sweep it under the carpet. And in the short term, things are rosy, and more things are getting swept under the carpet. But the more things you have under the carpet, the more difficult it becomes to walk on the carpet because you're going to have bombs, okay? <laughs> and eventually, there will be no space under the carpet, and then things fall apart. So in the short term, having faith would mean a more difficult journey, but I think the long-term um, rewards would seem much better. And finally, if we go back to Peter, one would argue that Peter had the most difficult, most... Um, he suffered the most emotionally in this whole encounter of Jesus getting um, arrested. And the reason for that is that Peter always put himself forward. He pushed more than every other person. In the transfiguration, he was the one who wanted to build, build a hut, I'm sorry, build a tent for, for, for Moses and Jesus to stay, okay? He was the one who walked on water. Now, Peter was the one who, that night, stepped up and said, I'm not going to let you down. He was the one who cut off the ear of, the, of one of the people who came. So he was deeply invested in this emotionally. And if you think about it, he also, he didn't run away like every other person. He actually went some distance with him. So his emotional involvement was deeper. And this is why it must have been a lot more difficult for him. It must have been a lot tougher. And I do think he had all the right intentions. When Peter said he was going to go the distance, I believe he meant it. When Jesus said Peter was the rock on which he would build a church, I believe that he meant it as well. But Jesus could see that there were cracks, and for that to be fulfilled, he had to go through that night. And in the same way, when we're faced with difficult situations, it is, it is important, difficult as it might seem, right? I think it is important if we can look for moments of clarity where we could find out how we can take something positive. Or maybe, I wouldn't say take something positive. Look for learning opportunities. I think there could be some value in that. And I believe that Peter did just that. And the reason why I say that is that if we go to the next um, verse... So this is Acts, Acts chapter 2. So this is the beginning of the church. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the, cr the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. And the rest, as we know, is history. This was the beginning of the church. And... <clears throat> When you look at what seems to have played out here, it would seem to me that the cracks that were revealed in Peter seem to be some type of spirit of being timid because he would start something but fall out 
along the way. So he stepped out on water with faith, but eventually he got scared. He followed Jesus for some distance, and then he got scared and he denied him. And I think these opportunities made him realize, okay, this is what I need to change. And for him to have stood up in front of more than 3,000 people, it would seem to me that he, even though it was difficult for him emotionally, he was able to look for that opportunity to, to seal those cracks. And the result was that he eventually fulfilled his purpose. So if we go to the next slide. So now going back to the question I started with, what would our lives be like if we, if we had the same attitude that high street stores have? What would our lives be like if we periodically checked in and we looked for things in us that are not profitable and we try to replace them with profitable ones? What would our lives be like if we look for opportunities in adversity to grow, opportunities in difficult circumstances to grow? I think maybe, just maybe, our lives will be such that we have more wholesome relationships, more wholesome relationships with our spouses, with our kids, parents, with God, with our friends. Maybe it would mean that we'd better be able to look for opportunities in adversity, and just like Peter, we would get to the point where would finally realize our true destiny, or maybe not. The truth is, I don't know. But I do believe that from the text we've read, from the verses in the Bible we have looked at, it would seem to me that the former is more likely the case. Thank you so much for listening.